please join a very special welcome for our guest, Mr. Charles Oakley. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Hall of Fame. What a joy to have you with us today. Thank you. I was hoping I'd be going in, but I guess not. <laughs> we'll work on that. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah, so can. tell me, growing up in the beautiful city, a great city of Cleveland, Ohio, tell me a little about your childhood, what part of the city you grew up in. Well, I just grew up on the east side of Cleveland. Um, you know, mother, uh, six kids, a uh, lot of family members, like cousins, aunts, but uh, in the city, had to catch two buses to school. Uh, you go that way and catch two, you go that way and catch two, so mm -hmm. sometimes I walked, but yeah. uh, I made it, that was the most important thing. What did you do? Were you involved in a lot of sports as a child right away? Um, I played little league football when I was growing up, and um, I was better than football, but uh, junior high I got cut in basketball, but when I got to high school I played football and basketball, but football was my number one sport because I never got cut in football, but I got cut <laughs> in basketball. But then as you go on in high school, you go to college, you gotta make a decision, football or basketball. So I didn't want to wake up at five o'clock every morning to play football, practice yes. twice a day. So basketball, you practice once. So I chose basketball. <laughs> <laughs> no baseball? Uh, no baseball, just kickball. There you go. Uh, you went to a great high school, yeah. uh, John Hay High School. It, it, it's a great academic school, has yeah. a great tradition. Right. Was that in your neighborhood or were you specially chosen to go? There? Uh, no. Um, well, when I was in junior high, I caught one bus to school walk. So there's always a bus involved. I was just getting there, so I did that. That was a tough part, but uh, no, um, I was borderline to going to Glenville. That was like half a mile away, but I went to school three miles away. So once they started busing, you had to go with your district sent you. So, but it was good though. We had a lot of great athletes come out of John Hay, like a lot of football players. I was the only basketball player, but um, it was great to go to go get you ready for life, mm. the huff and buff. You're going, seeing what's going on in the streets every day, and you got to pick a, pick a side, either go straight or go sideways. I kept going straight. And basketball, I'm sure, was part of that. Well, basketball was something, you know, basic when we was growing up, kids wanted to be act, into activities, so they weren't staying in the house on internet, social media, like they do now. So, um, so we chose to go try to play sports to stay out of trouble. But it was still trouble, things to do, but like I said, you got to make your own decision. Well, I know that the, the street in front of that high school is now uh, Charles Oakley Way, as a matter of fact. Oh, yes, they did put a sign in my way, but uh, you know, I guess when you do hard work and stay dedicated and, and stay true to what you're supposed to do in life, it, it worked out for you. Well, that's great. And, and so how did Virginia Union come into your life? It's a great school, one of the great black college, traditional well, black colleges Virginia in the country. Union was yeah. something, I guess, in life that um, it was this one guy went to Shaw University. And he went to Shaw back in the 50s and 60s and stayed at, he went to Shaw University. When he went to Virginia Union, he stayed there. And, and got, you know, after he finished school, got to be an assistant coach, to be a head coach. So back in them days, that you recruit, you recruit from what you know. So he knew Cleveland, and we knew our high school coach, and knew another coach. And I think like six of them were going to recruit from my school, Ohio State. So got there, I liked it, it was cold niche like a family type atmosphere and I was used to that. And you know, it just took me eight hours to get there. That was the hard part, but I caught a bus. <laughs> I still catch that bus. <laughs> <laughs> Two things I remember about Virginia Union. One, it has a great theology school, a great right. religious background, very tied to Baptist and all like that. I don't know if that affected, was that part of your, your academics at that point or not? Well, came up with that. You know, my grandfather and my grandmother and and they would preach always, you know, work, go to church, and read the Bible, do things. Really? And you get all the way, you know, that was, they did that all the time. My mm -hmm. grandfather, it was, he had eight kids, and um, that was us on his side. And my uh, father's side was more, you know, my mother's side was, my, you know, father, but my other grandfather had, uh, they had like 12 kids. So wow. it was always kids around one another. Mm -hmm. But like faith-based family, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, so when you go to churches, 
the ushers, part of your family, the deacons, you know, the, the choir, your cousin. Uh -huh. And, you know, so it was always some nitpick and some stuff together. Did you sing in the choir? No, I didn't. I couldn't sing. <laughs> yeah, I, just, uh, I, just, I just have to get the chairs on Sunday when they feed the, you know, feed the, uh, have, uh, they always have one month, they have dinner uh -huh. for the church yeah. and the pastor. Sure. Yeah. And Dave Robbins, of course, who was a great coach. Oh, Dave was great. Um, this guy stayed at Virginia Union. He had office all over. He turned them down because I, when he drove to Cleveland to get me from John Hay High School, I knew he was about something. He was in a pickup truck and had a Coke huh. and some crackers. That's all he had. Huh. <laughs> so when he came to my mother's house, recruited me. It was just something special about him. He was a real great, he's a great guy. I'm glad, I had, I'm glad he drove that truck to Cleveland to get me because if he wouldn't have drove that truck to Cleveland to get me, I don't know where I would be at today. Hmm. But he was the coach for 30... 30-something 30 years, second winning coach in, uh, in history behind Big Al's game. Right, and I don't know if folks know about the history of Virginia Union, but young people, go yeah. look it up, Google it. This is one of the great D2 schools, and yeah. we were lucky enough to host the D2 championships here in Springfield for right. some years. I came I love D2 down. ball. Well, great. We lost, but, you know, just spirits that come to play and coming from a historic black college to travel, because basically, we traveled on buses. Everything was a bus in my <laughs> life. I mean, we used to take five hours, but you know, we didn't, my school didn't have the money like these North Carolina Dukes and Clemson, so we always had to catch a bus there and back. Sure. You know, so not a lot of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but you managed to make it work, balancing academics yeah. and, and school. Yeah, so it's well, not easy. Well, that's how I had to choose one of the two sports, and uh, you know, only thing good about my school, I went to, it didn't take but three minutes to get to class. Yeah. They had four buildings, so <laughs> four corners. <laughs> it was you, good. You were, when you were drafted, so you were drafted in 1985, ninth player pick, taken by the hometown Cleveland Cavaliers, mm -hmm. but yeah. almost immediately traded to the Chicago Bulls. Did you well, know that was happening? Did you have any idea that was going to happen? Well, yes, because I was at my college coach house, him and his wife, Bunny. So I didn't go to New York because when they said, well, you might go second round, third round, I said, you know what? I'm going to be first round because I'm going to be first one to see it, come on TV. So I stayed at my college, went to his house, stayed at his house. They called me and said, well, you're going to get drafted by Cleveland but traded to Chicago. I said, okay, well, I will see it on TV. <laughs> mm -hmm, absolutely. But by this time, you had really worked on your game. Also. You, you, you were a great rebounder, a great yeah. collegiate rebounder. Was that something that came naturally to you? Was it something the coach worked with you on? Or how did you develop that part of your game so, so well? Well, not really. I think it's just coming up from playing football when I was young, then coming on through uh, junior high, getting cut in basketball, but I still play football. And then going to Union was like, I didn't know what was going to happen. But it was just about work. And um, I averaged 25 points and 17 rebounds, so I was yeah. a scorer. But once you get to the NBA, you got to find yourself because them the big boy pants. And I knew I come from a small school. And knowing who on your team, I'm playing with Michael Jordan, so I can't outscore him. <laughs> I know he can't make all his shots, so I get rebounds. Yeah, it's, it's funny, Satch Sanders <laughs> says the same thing. In college, I was a real great scorer. I joined the right. Celtics, and they said, play defense and rebound, you know? Well, a lot of guys lose themselves because they don't want to get off that, I'm the main man. You know, you can be the second man. Like on the plane, it's two guys in the cockpit. One gets sick, the other one fly the plane. So <laughs> I, can, I don't mind being second or third, but just know what you're doing. Well, something I've noticed as I was doing research and looking back at your career, and you joined a lot of teams on the way up. Yes. And I have to think that one of the reasons they were always on the way up is you joined them and players like you that made those teams better. Well, I talked to Michael Jordan on a regular basis, so I talked to him the other day, and um, we just talking about a few things. But f f when you say on the way up, I tell everybody, when I got to the league, I knew how to work. So basically, just get in and figure your way out and do other things. But yeah, Michael. Well, let's talk about that Bulls team. There was, a, you know, obviously, yeah. you, you went first, you went through a couple of coaches, which was interesting, Sam Albeck and Doug Collins and some, some great coaches. And of course, Phil Jackson lurking around there. I'd love to know what your thoughts were about that part of the, the team. Well, Bulls was one of them teams that the lead was tough. Uh, Michael Jordan was there before me a year. And he was going through it. He was averaging 30 some points and showing his greatness, talent. But sometimes in the league, it just ain't about talent. It's about getting a crew of guys can play together, like Golden State. Understand, two or three guys on the team gonna take the shots. Other guys got to play a role. And I think into NBA today, that's what's wrong with 28 of the 30 teams. I mean, two, those two teams get it. 
it, the two teams will be in the finals every year. Mm -hmm. So the other 28 teams, they, they can't find themselves. So um, when you don't find yourself, you'll be home watching other teams. So um, it's a tough league, you know. I think Golden State just got a binocular on it right now. So until somebody knock them off, it's going to be tough. Absolutely. So you join the Bulls, though, and they have this, you know, arguably the greatest player of all time, MJ, right. Michael Jordan. You've been around the game, and I'm always interested from a player's perspective. How quickly did you realize how special he was? Well, I seen a few clips because I was in Richmond. He's in Carolina, so when he was get, when he came out of college, his junior year, and what he did as a rookie, and you can see. And then the next year, I get the chance to play with Michael Jordan to see that. Wow, it is for real. But you know, he's the type of guy who just worked so hard. I couldn't believe how hard he worked in practice and. I, when he got to the game, it just come natural. He just, he just did great. You had a role, though, was, you know, became defined. It was well known around the league that, that after a while that you were there kind of protecting Michael. Yeah, and, they, and I wondered, did that just naturally flow? That It was a very much more physical game, obviously, in those days. Did you just take that role on, that leave, leave my guy alone? Well, I, it was a role. Just My thing was, you were, when you're a power forward and you're a tough-minded guy, and you're like somebody picking on your little brother. You're going to try to say, well... I got to go protect him, but he was a big brother, but I just <laughs> took care of him. But uh, no, it was just great to play that role because, um, you, when he, you know, you got to protect the goal. He was the goal, and, you know, he got to make sure everything else was right around the goal. Sometimes sure. you get some of these superstars don't take care of the players, and I see a lot of that, and I don't like that because I'm giving my game up, sacrificing my talent for you to shine because you're the man. I yeah. want you to be the man. I'm going to try to make sure that I can be here as long as you're the man. That team, of course, was just developing, and Scotty and, and Horace, oh, yeah. they everyone built. joined the team, building around you guys. Uh, and, and I said, Doug Collins took over, and Phil Jackson's the yeah. assistant coach. And could you feel things really starting to come together? Well, there? first of all, you got to get Jerry Kraut. He's not here with us today. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, Jerry Kraut did a great job of putting pieces together. He took chances with guys like me and Scotty. Scotty went to a small NEI school, right. and I went to Division II school. but. He had, a, he had an eye for talent, and you see what it happened. When it, once they put it together, they, had a, they probably had a run like Boston had back in the 60s. Mm. You know, they won six out of eight. Boston, what, 10 out of, 10 out of 11 or something like that. But um, you see once they got on the trail, and, it, you know, it was a brand for the NBA. So the NBA protect their goal, too. So mm -hmm. they make sure Michael got everything he wanted. <laughs> Well, this, we Celtics fans down here grew up in that know. game against well, 63 points against the Celtics. Yeah, in the I was game. in that game, too. I know. But uh, yeah. Boston, I, playing uh, Chicago, playing Boston, but uh, it's a tough place to play in Boston Garden. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But then <laughs> you're traded to the New York Knicks. Right. I'm sure that was a, kind of a shock to you Is it on the way up. Uh, like I said, when you, don't, when, you, when you never had nothing in life, I don't – to me, I didn't let it shock me because I had no control. When mm -hmm. I had control of the situation, I can understand. But I think once they traded it, it wasn't bad from Chicago to New York. It's the biggest city, more yep. things, the lights brighter. I just left I ain't have Michael. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it was a big difference playing with Patrick and playing with Michael. Sure, absolutely. But this, those were team, great, great Nick teams. Oh, yeah, we had great teams. Know. We just, we just like um, some of these guys, I guess we just like, Say like New England Patriots. So Miami can't beat them. The Jets can't beat them. All them teams in the division wish New England was in another division. So we felt the same way. But uh, we gave them a fight every time we got into the ring. But it wasn't no okay, Walt. No, but you, you played that, that Nick team was a very hard-nosed team, very physical yeah. team, very great defenders. I mean, and some remarkable personalities. You mentioned Patrick Ewing. I mean, a, a world-class well, world class player. It was... A, Hey, Michael Jordan and Tom Brady, I think they did guys the same way. They was, they were the GOAT on their team, and they played like the GOAT when they had to. And I, some remarkable personalities. Pat Riley, of course, being involved with that team. I wonder about some of the guys who you played with who you think back on, Kiki and, and John Starks and Anthony Mason. I'm curious as to your relationship with Mace, who also another remarkable player yeah, on those teams. Yeah, Mace, rest in peace, Mason. He passed three years ago. Uh, when Pat Riley came to New York, he brought a different attitude. He was a guy who won championships, and I mean, we had a meeting one day. He said, oh, I want you to change your game. I'm going to cut your minutes. I said, you know what, coach? I can't argue with you because I don't have a ring. The one I bought, the one you you wear and you you wanted in L.A. So my thing is, I don't mind stepping in a different role. So they went on for two years. Then three years came. Three years went past. I said, coach, 
I don't think your role working. So <laughs> can I go back to my normal role? Uh-huh. And that's the year we went to the finals, but we lost, but we went, it changed. You know, yeah. I knew I could make a difference, but I had to accept his role to be a better man. Sure. But what was the experience like going to the NBA Finals? All of us we can dream about that. Uh, well, yeah. I was dreaming. Especially so I got in to, New York. It I was, mean, oh, you know? New York. It's no place like New York. But um, it was fine. But my thing is, you don't just want to go. You want to win it. That's the biggest thing. And um, y'all is probably spending a lot around here in Boston. They want a lot of rings. But um, it was nice to be there. But I really want to win because I, I work so hard and seeing that, you know, when people win it, what, how they celebrate and the family and the, and the city just embrace you, it's a great thing. Absolutely. And, and when you think back on that team, what do you, what do you think was the characteristic of that team? Uh, together as a group, we all, you had each well, other's backs or was it a very physical, we, you know, a wild, crazy had, bunch of guys? Or? We definitely had one another back. And I think yeah. this, the men of the toughest of being in New York, and you know the coaching staff, um, we got the support from the fans, but we just the nice is we just couldn't score enough bucket. It wasn't the point we didn't know what we was doing. We had the details and uh, we had the recipe to the, make the dish, but we always cooked the dish, and sometimes we didn't cook it. <laughs> we didn't cook it enough, but um, we put our heart out there every night we played. That's the most important thing. We didn't shortchange the fans because we know how hard they worked and bring their families to come and support you and. I really, you know, a family go home happy and say, well, they, at least they gave effort. They didn't, you know, get blown out by 20, 30 points. And I'm curious. You know, New York is, I lived in New York for many years when I was working right. for the league, and it's a, it's a great city, great, great city. And you were beloved by New York. I mean, New York really embraced you. But New York has a lot of distractions. New York's not an easy place for a lot of athletes to thrive in. Why do you think you could thrive there? What was it about that city that you really, they just embraced you and you felt at home in New York City? I just took it like being back in Cleveland, thinking about getting on the bus, but I caught the train in New York. But uh, it was always, you do, when you do tough-minded things, sometimes you get, you sense things come easy to you. Like playing in New York, it's just like, hey, I'm playing hard, I know what I'm doing. And, and people in New York, you can't fool them by on the court just being out there. They can see detail, they understand the basketball, football, baseball, whatever in New York. So if you don't give effort into what you're doing, they can see right through you. But I gave out and gave them my heart every night, and you know I appreciate they like the way I played, and you know you only can do your best. Yeah, but there was great rivalries, of course, back in the days with the Celtics, with the Sixers, with the Bulls, yeah. Pistons. Oh my God, R- remarkable. Were there certain players you particularly a looked forward to playing against? or particularly did not want to play against in those days? Well, I'm the guy who was trying to light zone, so when I come in the building, ain't nobody there, so I just go out, it's like, hey, every guy, I gotta try to just stop him or do my best against him, because energy and effort is what I had to bring to the game every night, and I might not get two shots or 10 shots, I couldn't worry about that. I couldn't be like these, uh, why would see would be D was like I need catches because that'd be selfish. <laughs> yeah. So my thing is just go out and play your game. If you play good, things happen good. Now you you would trade it then and again, and this was kind of later in your career to one of the teams that really fascinated me, and I was always I loved watching that Raptors team play that you right. would trade to Toronto. First, in a great, in my opinion, underrated city, one of the great cities in the world to to be in. Uh, I was wondering, what it was like going first from New York City to Toronto for you? Well, I mean, from New York to Toronto, was, it was different. But my thing is, people is people. Well, no matter where you go, the court's still the same, the rim the same size. So just take your game. You know, some people gain travel, some people gain don't. But what I do is consistent. Like I said, I do the little things and make things, my teammates happy. The fans come and see me play. They see I'm playing with energy, effort. So once we got to Toronto, we had a lot of veterans. And the veterans all want to win, so we sacrificed for Vincent Tracy, Butch Carter was the coach. Right, we we made the playoff two out of three years. We was going forward, and then management made their decision. They want to make some trades. Uh, you only get two or three years in sports to go up. When you don't go up, if you're going up, make a trade to get better. If you don't, you're going down. That's interesting to hear you say that because I thought that was a really special potential team. Mm-hmm. It seemed to be mel- melding around Butch Carter as the coach. And you had these two brilliant young players, Vince Carter and, and Tracy right. McGrady. Uh, did you feel it was really coalescing, coming together as a great unit? I definitely felt it coming together because Butch's knowledge and what he, how he put, you know, gives prepared for a situation on the court. Probably one of the best coaches I've seen with X is old. I mean, it just he was that good, and and it showed in game situation. We never had a like you said, like Belichick. You never see him 
far one the pressure, you know. So Butch was in the conversation with great coaches, even though we didn't win the championship. And you just have to give me respect for knowing how to put a team together. And uh, we didn't make it, but, you know, we were on the right track. So, but management kind of made some changes. Managed, there. made some, tra you know, management always, I think, I don't think the next management, they did some, you know, to me, they, they shouldn't have made a trade because we just had to play Philadelphia the year before. We took them to the semifinal. We lost in seven games, and you trade two of your starters. That don't work. I mean, baseball maybe, but in basketball, when you got some key guys, I mean, yeah, this guy look good, but he in the summer league. But let's see what he looked like during the regular season. So they tried some, it didn't work. Could you tell right away how special Vince and Tracy were? Well, it was a lockout year with Vince, but Tracy was there the year before. But yes, Vince, uh, you know, when you see a guy can jump higher than Michael Jordan, I mean, <laughs> woo, Dominique, wow. But uh, Vince was just, he was so anxious to play that year and this and that. Once he got started, he had a good crew of veterans around him. So we allowed him to make a mistake. But we held him accountable, though. We didn't let him be late for practice. You couldn't eat in the locker room. You couldn't be on your cell phone. And I was tough on him. Well, you no, you. I think they, the Raptors look to you for that. I think they want well, you leadership, to be, yeah. yeah, leadership. Well, to be a leader, you got to be. See, some guys is fake leaders. So my thing is, you got to be all about uh, practice, doing stuff with the teammate. I, I'm a cook, so I used to invite them in my house, and you know, on the road, try to get them together. You know, just bring them all together. The thing is, sometimes it, practice ain't enough. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of guys that now nah, we don't practice enough, but you still can do stuff as a team outside of practice to come together. So mm -hmm. we kept the team niche. We was real close in Toronto for a lot of different guys, veterans guys, because a lot of guys like to go their own way. But we, we, we all threw our, uh, we threw our ropes in before we got to Canada and said, mm -hmm. we're going to all be in one boat and let's go do it. Yeah, well, you, obviously the game was a very different game back in the day when you came up. It was a much more physical game. Yes, real uh, physical. What do you, th the transition of the game, what do you think of the transition of the game? Now much more wide open offense, three point shooting. You could shoot, you were a real scorer. Your yeah. game would have adapted. If you were playing today, you'd be a very different player. Well, a lot of people ask me, could I adapt? I said, I can adapt because my thing is, I can play basketball, I had an IQ. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys who don't have IQ can't adapt. That's why you see a lot of guys late in their career uh, AI, you know, and Carmelo gonna go through it. But they don't want to. They don't want to feel like they getting old. We all gonna get old. We all. That's why sometimes I wish I was. I'm glad I was a role player because my thing in my game always gonna be simple. I don't have to shoot 20 points. I can go out and play five, 10 minutes. Now this guy getting older, he need 20 shots. Now he getting five shots. He look. He ain't gonna look good. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's just parts of the game. You just gotta know that. Hey, when it's your time, when it's not your time. But um. I just, I love the game. But you were, I mean, it's interesting to hear you say that. I mean, you were power forward back in the day. Power forward. You know, yeah. you and, and uh, Paul Silas and yeah. Mark Maurice Lucas, some of the great power forwards back in the day. Now they talk about stretch fours. You know, it's, it's a whole different, whole different role from the power forward. Well, they stretching. <laughs> <laughs> they need to be stretching, real stretching. But, uh, I mean, it's a stretch four. But they, like, if you're a dirt bird, um, Kevin Durant somewhere, somebody, a few other guys, but it's not really a lot of good stretch floor. They saying that because they want the game to be wide open. Mm -hmm. This new analytics, you know, they, oh, you shoot a three is better than a two. I don't believe in that. If you got a two, make the two. Mm -hmm. And you see what Houston did. They shot 27 threes and I, they went home. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you just got to be smart with basketball. They want more scoring, but yeah. everybody can't score. You know, Golden State got three of the best shooters probably play basketball. Well, you talked to you talk about Butch Carter maybe being your favorite coach. You've done some coaching uh, uh, through the years. Do you enjoy it? Is that something you feel you can uh, pass on what you know? Because you had you had this ability to make every team you were on better. You understood the game. I wonder if you felt you were called to that at some point. Well, it happened when I, was, when I was you know coaching with Michael Jordan and Charlotte. I coached two years, and they had Kwame Brown. Nobody never took time out to work with him. So. Once they picked me up, I think we won, you know, we was over 500, you know, so and then I got hurt and we went under 500, but I'm coaching the big three basketball right now. My record's yeah. bad. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm coaching the big three. It's a new league. Uh, we playing at Boston tomorrow. My team, we two and four. Uh -huh. uh, we got some, man, we got some guys <laughs> on my team, just they don't get it. <laughs> I tell them we go on the right side, they go to the left side. <laughs> They funny though, but it's a good lead though. The kids come out, uh, the parents, it's some different, it's half court. It's 14 seconds, every uh, possession, 25 points, halftime, 50 points to win the game. It's, it's exciting, you know, should come out tomorrow if you can. 
you talk about a lot of the, the, the I mean, you, you played on as a teammate with some of the greatest players in the history of the game, yeah. maybe the greatest with Michael and Patrick and Vince and some of these right. great, great players. What do you think gave them that? Was there something special about them coming in or you, you observed them close up closer than we ever will? Well, Vince, uh, I can say he was young, went to Carolina. You, you get to see a lot of guys who go to Carolina, them like a dupe or somewhere, Kansas. You, tend to see like, well, they average 15 and 17 points, maybe at most in college. Now you get Michael to average 30, career probably 28, Vince probably get 25, 27. You don't know that the points, but you can see the talents there. Uh, how they do it, consistent, uh, you know, playing with Michael, he just eat a steak before every game. Uh, I don't know how he eat a steak, but <laughs> Vince, he's a guy, you know, just a lot of energy. Uh, Patrick is just more of a guy, just more of a zone-in guy. So everybody got their own ways of getting ready for games. But uh, I mean, you the man, you got to do it every night. Um, it's like baseball, you know, most of the best players want to play 162 games. Basketball, the, when we play, everybody want to play every game. Now they want to play 50 games. Yeah. So they want to take break during the season. You don't take breaks. That's when mid-season you get on your best game because you know everything come as the late season, your mind, your body start maturing for the playoff. I did hear back in the day when I, I remember hearing about you as a cook and being a really good cook and having the guys to your house and, right. and putting meals together. Did you love that? It was an important part of your life, bringing the, the team and your, your friends together for uh, that part of the off the court bonding. Well, first of all, I had to win them over. They were like, you can't cook, this and that. <laughs> so every time we go to Cleveland, I take them to my mother's house. All 12, 15, the train, whoever, they go to my mother's house. It's like, they want to go two days in a row. But <laughs> So they probably put two and two together. Whereas well, mom can cook, maybe it rubbed off. But it, it did rub off. That did rub off. So the guys, you know, I just, before the plane, I bring stuff to the locker room, like on Monday night or Thursday night. I let each guy on the team pick something. I would cook their dish. So mm -hmm. I'm pretty good in the kitchen. Yeah, so it's you know, a remarkable life if you look back growing up from streets of Cleveland, right. six kids, and uh, this journey through this game of basketball. You were a tremendous player, tremendous IQ. As you look at all these great people above our heads here, you know, all the many of you played with and against, you're, when you think back about the game, what it's meant in your life, I'm just wondering what you, what, how you reflect on that, uh, that part of it. It made me want to say, I just say, like, wow, 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 um, making it out of Cleveland. I mean, you know, going to college, getting a chance, you know, get a free education and get a, my mom and dad had to pay no money, so um, I'd probably still be playing grants now. But uh, to see all these pictures up here, I've been to Hall of Fame about six times, and I was saying I wasn't going to come back unless they, you know, I know they're working on a wing over here, That's so right. I hope they invite me to it. There you go, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and just one, one last question about another great player coming out of Ohio. You, when you watch LeBron play, uh, you, what do you think if you were playing with him or against him? How would your how would your game be? Well, I'm about to treat him the same way I treat everybody else, but I'm playing against him. But <laughs> playing with me, he's cool. But no, <laughs> that's my guy. I was just with him out west. Um, I've been knowing LeBron since like junior high, high school, and um, he really, you know, uh, he really making a difference in the world. Not just you know basketball on the court, off the court with kids doing straight things in Akron, Ohio for trying to develop people and uh, get them in the right way to have a great life, uh, give them a free education. And he just, he just doing it all. I mean, there's no other guy who in the last 20, 25, 30 years, I know who are doing what he's doing as a person and um, staying out of trouble, raising family. Um, just, you know, a lot of people don't like him. I don't know why, but there's always gonna be some people don't like some other people, but if you hate on him, you need to look at yourself because he he's not giving you that. If you're gonna hate about basketball, that's I mean that's nothing to hate about because we all had our best days and bad days in basketball. But uh, when the guy can go to the final eight straight times, I don't think nobody did that since Boston back in the 50s and 60s, mm. and with no talent. You know, Bill Russell had mm. he has five All Stars with him. Yep. I mean, like Hall of Famer. Sure. And uh, but. Um, you know, he just keep working. You know, he's a he's a guy who don't go by what they say. He know his his you know his goal, what he's trying to do in life, and what he achieve is what he doing is real special. Um, you know, even though Cleveland, and I'm from Cleveland, went to the final this year. It was kind of embarrassing to get swept, but 
you know, when you get to the finals, you got to, you know, at least win one game. Oh, listen. I mean, they, Golden State is yeah, good. I thought huh? they had the first game, actually. I yeah, mean, yeah, you know. I know he's been a blessing in so many of these kids' lives them, in Akron. That's one of them bang-bang calls. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I don't know. Hopefully Cleveland, they might win 25, 30 games this year. They're going to be a big <laughs> drop-off. Well, they could have used you this and from the first to last. Yeah, exactly. I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to come over to meet Mr. Oakley and get an autograph. So we're going to be moving over here. But before we do, please join me in one more round of applause for our very special guest, Mr. Charles Oakley. Thank you.